Let's talk about some of the evidence-based care uh, that we know works and we know we apply uh, to heart failure patients and where we're going to go with that. Um, we have the renin-angiotensin-aldosterone, or RAS system, right? We've got the sympathetic nervous system pathways. Those are the SNS pathways, and they're both associated in complex ways with HREF, uh, HEF-REF. Hmm? Maybe it's just better to say the other one, heart failure with reduced ejection fraction. But why don't you sort of put this puzzle together for us, actually, a little bit? Sure. So, um, so the way, I, I, and I think we'll focus on the HEF-REF population, or the population with low ejection fraction, and I think we all now understand uh, in our neurohormonal model that heart failure begins with a cardiac insult that results in a decline in cardiac output that initiates a sequence of sustained neurohormonal activation. And initially, that neurohormonal activation, which is activation of the systems you talked about, renin angiotensin and aldosterone, the sympathetic nervous system, are adaptive. They actually help us to maintain blood pressure, to um, uh, um, maintain cardiac output and augment uh, forward flow. But over time, that sustained activation of the system actually promotes deleterious processes in the heart. The heart gets bigger. Uh, the heart gets stiffer. Uh, more salt and water are held onto when it's not needed. And that's what precipitates the heart failure syndrome. So sustained neurohormonal activation, we think, is the crux of heart failure progression. And so most of our therapies really act to interrupt that neurohormonal activation. But let me, let me just ask the naive question. If these are autoregulatory mechanisms that are there to correct problems with the, patho with the physiology, low blood pressure, low oxygen delivery, whatever you would like to say, when you start to turn these things off, why is it not intuitive that you make things worse, not better? I think that's actually the, uh, the, the, um, uh, one of the difficult things to understand about heart failure management is that, that these systems are valuable and corrective to a point, but they're not intended to be activated in an unfettered or unrestricted way. But it's, it, and it's also really important, Peter, to remember that they didn't evolve to help us with heart failure. They evolved to help us with, uh, with uh, Exsanguination with bleeding, with you know, it's that saber-toothed uh, saber tiger, tooth tiger yeah. that we <laughs> were right. all running from, uh, <laughs> you know, several million years ago. Um, when we start to bleed out, we have to have systems that allow us to clamp down, and that's what the renin angiotensin right. system. As you is. empty out, you want right. the SVR to go up, otherwise, it, it, exactly. No blood but what happens in heart failure is that uh, your kidneys and your uh, your vasculature believes that's happening. And so these systems get activated, but incorrectly. Okay, so let's take a look then what we can do to interrupt some of these vicious cycles, if you will. Is that a fair, fair description of some of these, these yep. pathways? And, and get at the heart of FREF so that we can correct the, 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 the pharmacologic abnormality and maybe mm -hmm. help the heart do a better job. And I would think that anybody listening to this broadcast or watching it would think, ah, heart failure, too much water, wrong place, Diuretics. Really, what about that? So there's two different um, strategies for treating patients with HEFREF, and one is to treat the symptoms, and that's where diuretics come in. But diuretics don't have any sort of effect on prolonging survival or anything um, beneficial in terms of disease progression. They actually worsen things. They lead to an activation of the renin angiotensin aldosterone system. They're a necessary evil. We use them because we have to treat the congestion. But in terms of the disease itself or the syndrome, they're not beneficial. What is beneficial is the other strategies that are geared towards blocking both the renin angiotensin aldosterone system and the sympathetic nervous system. All right, so you're telling me I'm squishing, I'm wet, I'm going to use a diuretic, but it's not going to help because it's just going to make things worse. It's going to empty me out and potentiate all these other mechanisms that are bad. So let's take a look at these other mechanisms, right? If you say that some of them are are not designed to do what they're trying to do. Let's talk about the, uh, the SNS system. We have beta blockers here. Now, to me, at least on first pass when I first heard this, some guy's got a reduced ejection fraction. You're going to give him an anti catechol a beta blocker, or her, not to be sexist about this. Uh, that's as counterintuitive as it gets, and yet it works. Who's going to tell me why? Why does that work? Akshay? Well, I think that that acutely that is what happens when you give a beta blocker and this is one of the reasons that we actually in patients who are in the throes of cardiogenic shock or patients who have acute decompensated heart failure we tend not to give beta blockers because 
the negative inotropic effects dominate the effects, but in, in long-term applications, and when the dose is titrated gradually, there is uh, receptor downregulation, there, mm -hmm. uh, there is a modification of secondary messenger stream, um, and there are effects on remodeling of the heart uh, that actually become beneficial. So okay. we see ejection fraction acutely drop on administration of a beta blocker, but in chronic application, the ejection fraction goes up. That's fascinating. And so you, you're going to get it this long term. It's not the acute phase that you're looking at. Although I and wanted to also add here, and I completely agree with you, but patients that have been on beta blockers chronically and then have an acute episode, generally you wouldn't want to discontinue it unless the beta blocker of titration is the cause of the okay. acute heart failure. Okay. You, you know, Peter, it's, it's interesting. When I was in medical school, it was considered malpractice to give a patient with heart failure beta blocker. I was alluding to that. Yeah, and you know, the only reason we changed is because uh, of uh, well-designed clinical trials that challenged this conventional wisdom. And they and were based on underlying understanding of the pathophysiology. Exactly. In other words, it should work, let's try it, and look at that. 